Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mysterious Pals. My name is Chris, and I'm here today to take you on a journey through time and space. But first, I want to introduce my best pal, Jordan. Jordan, thank you for being here. And we are at a different orientation, so this is a little weird looking at you. Yeah, yeah. We're trying a little just different setup here in the mysterious studio. Dungeon. Studio Dungeon. Studio Dungeon, that'd be a pretty good yeah. name. Yeah. Also might have different kind of connotations. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sure. So. Let's roll with it. We are here to party. <laughs> Jordan, how was your week? It was pretty good. Yeah. How about you, Chris? It's fine. Yeah. I'm here. Here we are. Some people have complained that we talk too much at the beginning. Oh, uh, yeah. Have yeah. made those comments to us. <laughs> to I say, thank you for stopping by. <laughs> thank you for commenting. Yeah. Some people might call it tangents. Uh, we just call it, you know, being friends. Yeah, we're just calling it having a good time. <laughs> I don't know if I like looking at this. It's weird. Yeah, this is a weird angle. For those that are listening, we're in a different angle to the camera. Yeah, we're like because we've been told that uh, that's how people do it. We need to be more engaging to our viewers and make them part of the conversation. To that, I say, nay. <laughs> but we're doing it. But we're trying it anyway. <laughs> maybe we'll, the next step is we maybe back to the normal. Yeah, we'll we'll see how this goes. We'll see how it goes. It's, it feels. Feels weird. I feel like I'm. I feel like we'll catch on just like the last time. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. What do you got there, Chris? We're gonna go on a little journey, and this is gonna be kind of a throwback. Then throw further back to a, one episode. Okay. Okay. And then we're gonna jump forward in this episode. We're gonna just do a couple couple things here, but I'm gonna start you out with a story. Oh. You, you don't have to read it. I'm gonna read it to <laughs> oh you. <my> <laughs> There is no pie, just me. I was just reading it together. That's just it, and then it's, it, we're over. So, like I said, this is going to be, for those who have listened to multiple episodes, you may find similarities, and that's what I'm starting with. I don't know where to look. Look at the camera. Mm. Look at the monitors. You look happy for being here. <laughs> <laughs> look like a good friend. <laughs> Look like you care. <laughs> yeah. Look like you care and want to be friends with me. Right. Look like you don't want to leave. <laughs> All right. We're going to talk about something that reaches through the ages. Ooh. We're going to go on a journey. And like I said before, it's going to bring you back to a previous episode. But, oh, God, you almost tipped that over. Ooh. Whoa. Honk, honk. Here we go. <laughs> Returning home from church one night, a group of people... I thought this would be, was this would be about you. <laughs> when I was returning home from church one I was night. turning home from church one night. I said, hey, why don't I be friends with this guy <laughs> that I found walking down the road? Who doesn't want to be here. Yeah. I, I called him up, and he's like, oh, come over. Waste your time. You want to live together? So this goes, this, this, we're going to start. We're going to start right now. Zero, zero. Right. This is called the Merkel incident. We'll, we'll, uh, you'll figure out why in a second. Returning home from church one night, a group of people in Merkel, Texas, came across a rope and an anchor being dragged across the, uh, the country until it finally snagged on a railway line. These people were walking home. The rope they saw was attached to an airship with lights shining from the windows. Ooh. Airships speaking your... Yeah, sounds thinking, familiar. Sounds thinking familiar. you stink any? Okay. The man climbed down the rope, cut it below him, and was carried away with the airship. This story was printed in the Houston Post from April 28th, 1897, told from, from churchgoers on the way home in Merkel, Texas. It was called the Merkel Incident. So they saw a rope dragged across the country? like A rope dragging across the country, like the, through the ground, with an anchor on the end. Okay. And then it got they snagged. Man. They, well, it got snagged on the railway line. A guy climbed down the rope, cut the rope. A human man. And then they went off on their way. The anchor, strangely enough, is still able to be seen in Merkel, Texas. Well, we got to go there now. So does this story sound familiar? It should, because during the years of 1896 and 1897, there were many reports across the United States of mysterious airships, an intervention, uh, an invention that could have been an experiment 
or some type of other worldly vi- visitors okay, okay. that were seen in the sky throughout the entire country for these two years. And we know that in our episode we talked about yes, the airships of 1897, 1896, that some of these, these stories, there was many, 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 thousands yep. across the entire country. It could have been uh, a crazy inventor. It could have been alien visitors. But like it, I said- The sightings moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. Correct. Right? Yeah. In this story, it, well, that, that story. Yeah, yeah. In our story today, we're going to take even a further coast. We're going to go to a further <laughs> coast. Further coast. Yeah. Right. The anchor, like I said, can be seen in a local blacksmith shop currently in Merkle, Texas. Cool. Yeah. So- we discussed this event of airships in America in 1897, which could have been led, you know, a lot of people think it's kind of the beginning of man's flight and these sure, experiments. Yeah. Yeah. Or fake news. Or, or fake news, right? Or aliens. Yeah. Yeah, we're kind of, kind of want it to be aliens, but. That'd be great. One of the first stories like this was referenced. One of the first stories like this was referenced to an event like the Merkel incident in 743 CE. 743, 743 CE. CE. Today we're going to talk about a story from Ireland. All right. And some say ancient Ireland. We're going to call this mystery How to Sail to Heaven. <laughs> the airships, a cl- uh, the airships, of Clone McNoise. Clone McNoise. Okay. The airships of Clone McNoise. You know how many times I listen to that guy in the video tell me that? It's the French guy, right? I don't know. Is he French? I don't know. It sounds French. I've had to do that a few times. And I still mispronounce. Yes. Clone McNoise. It's very well documented that we mispronounce things. Okay. So this is Ships of the Sky, the airships of Clone McNoise. Again, first reference in 743 CE. To unravel the mystery of these celestial ves- vessels, we turn to core accounts and documents, uh, documentary sources that are available. Th- this story is referenced in many different forms and begins with the very oldest references. And it all takes place around, there's actually th- two major locations. One of them, uh, there's three locations that these stories take place. Okay. Two of them are in Ireland. Two of them are pretty... Uh, ancient and then there's another one which is London England which we'll talk about later (laughs) so Clone McNoise is a sacred uh, site it's uh, found in the mid 6th century it's one of Ireland's most significant monastic 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 sites what's that mean monastic yeah like religious okay yes sorry so between 700 AD and 1200 AD, which would be CE, right? Mm-hmm. Which mm-hmm. in the last episode, mm-hmm. I should say CE, not AD. Yes. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> 700 CE to 1200 AD, CE, AD. Yep. It blossomed into a major, uh, oh, there's no way I'm going to say this word right. Ecclesi- ecclesiastical center? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. A hub of religious life, cultural learning, and craftsmanship and trade. The monastery's strategic power and prestige were shaped by its unique geographic location. It's in Central Ireland, the very hard Ireland making it a vital crossroads. It's by the River Shannon. It's positioned right a, a, riv, a ridge above the River Shannon. It overlooks surrounding uh, the surrounding lowlands, and it con- was considered a communication hub because of it's a major junction, both north and south river traffic and main east to west land route. So right in the perfect location. Okay. So all these things, all these stories that we're gonna talk about, the airships of Clan McNoise, Clan McNoise, comes from very specific references. There's, I think there's eight of them. And they're all from different writings from a, lots of different eras. Like it's just like we're through, starting- through Ireland. All in Ireland, yeah. except for one story. Right. But they happen across many, many centuries. Like we're not just like one, sure. we're not just one story here, which is what makes this story kind of interesting. But again, going back to airships, still being seen, or now they're being seen even earlier. All right. The first reference that we have, really, and again, this is based on uh, scholars, 
and historians really researching this this kind of thing. And there's a couple of really good books we used. If you look in the show notes, and I'll mention them throughout um, the different authors and stuff we used as I, I used as references. But um, a lot of this, a lot of this other stuff, is kind of hard to understand for me because it goes back to called the Annals of the Four Masters. Okay. So references to the Annals of Ulster. And the Annals of Ireland, also known as the Annals of the Four Masters, provide a glimpse into these into this phenomenon. So, several sets of Irish annals, those of Ulster, T- Tigernock, Clone McNoy's, and the Four Masters, all briefly mention a strange apparition or some type of flying airship. Hmm. Something. The annals are mainly a, a compilation of early annual annals, which I don't even know what any of this is. <sighs> although there is some original work. So these, the Four Masters, I believe the idea is. The annals uh, of the Four Masters were all compiled. What became the annals of the Four Masters was compiled between 1632 and 1636 in Ireland, uh, which is in the town of Donegal, Donegal Abbey. Donegal? Yeah. Mm. The annals are largely limited to accounts of birth, deaths, and activities of the Gaelic nobility of Ireland, and the wider social trends or events are up for contemporary historians to establish. So the, these annals that were compiled to become the annals of the Four Masters were taken from all these different public records and all this stuff that was yeah. going on at the time. I want to be a master. Yeah. On the other hand, um, the annals are one of few sources in Irish uh, for the, for this period, so um, they provide a lot of insight into what was going on, such as the Nine Years' War for Gaelic Irish perspective. So there's like there's a lot of different things going on in Ireland that these kind of annals of four masters and all these different Ulster, Clemic noise, they all kind of come together to help build that. Okay, uh, the story of all that. The, four, the Annals of the Four Masters uh, succinctly state that the age of Christ, 743, ships were uh, with their crews were plainly seen in the sky. That's what it says. That's a quote. Yep. Well, while historical variation exists, these accounts likely describe the same events. So in all of the, four, of the annals that were uh, brought together to become the Annals of the Four Masters, they all have some type of event around 743 are around that era, that time, which could be traced back to 743 about. They all say something about the same event. That's why... It, okay, so multiple accounts are mentioning the same event. That, of these different annals of Irish, you know, the, the four masters that were all brought okay. together in the 1600s. All the individual parts came together and they all had a reference to this thing. Sorry, who who were the four masters? Like, who are the... Like, who That's are what they people? call... So, there was the annals of Ulster, the annals of Ireland... And the annals of Clumic Noise and the annals of Tiger Knock. Tiger. Okay. So I think I will go into different books later. Are these but like heads of houses or like heads of. Uh, I think one of them was actually heads maybe? was a group that kind of took over a castle and kind of wrote down a bunch of stuff. Okay. I think I took out the actual. Like heads of clans? Yeah, it, it's a lot of different stuff. And a lot of it was compiled by religious leaders and stuff. Okay. We're gonna go into these called the these different books that okay. make up the annals, I believe, or were included in them. One of them was like this clan that took over this castle, and it was the it was written so that the son of the king could tell him everything that the son's gonna to need to know to be a good ruler or something like okay. that, like All that right. type of stuff. It's a lot yeah. of like just a lot of it is again just birth records, death records, what sure. was going on, like general history, and some of it was like you know religious history. Some like there's a lot of different things in there, and okay. I think. Like I said, there's even an Old Norse book that we're going to talk about. Mm. So there's like a lot of, it, again, it's so long time ago, a lot of stuff was going on. Yeah. Some of this stuff is was undated. Some of the stuff was lost history. There's maybe been other ones that were lost history that maybe it had reference to these airships in there, but we're going to go on. So like I said, the, the occurrence, this occurrence was remarkable enough to be recorded in these different books, these different uh, records. Although it didn't really go into a lot of detail of like exactly what happened. Each one of them are basically saying something happened that had some type of ship involved in the sky. Okay. okay. The, these airships made appearances in three locations based on the sources that referenced the event or events. Well, actually two in the annals of the four masters. And then one was also, we'll talk about later, was happened in, in London. So the first 
the two places that were mentioned in the earliest writings were the Clone McNoise, which was the Cl- Celtic monastery, um, and then Telltown, which is a central gathering fair in County Maith, which is in Ireland. I think I think it's not that far from Clone McNoise. Okay. And I'm sorry if I got that wrong. So those are the, the, the annals of uh, the four masters that kind of mention this in those two areas separately. My second reference here is the, the story also unfolds in a book called the Book of Leinster, which becomes a part of the events in the Telltown Assembly. So this Book of Leinster uh, was part of an account of events in the town's records. Okay. The Book of Leinster is a medieval Irish manuscript compiled in 1160. It is now kept in the Trinity, uh, Trinity College of Dublin. So this still record still exists. In the book, there are three ships, uh, three ships voyage in the air above the assembly while the men of Ireland celebrate with Domnall, son of Merkchad, Merc- who reigned from 743 to 763. And this was written almost 400 years later? Uh, compiled. Okay. The book itself was okay. compiled 1160. So they took all the writings from them together. Gotcha. And that's still kept, and this is still on record in Dublin. You can still go see this book. That's number two. Number three. This, uh, this was the book of Ballymott. And I got a lot of this information, uh, especially this reference from John Carey, who wrote a book in 1992 called Aerial Ships, the Underwater Monasteries, the Evolution of the Monastic Marvel. The other one is Michael McCahan, Fall of 1998, Voyagers in the Fault of Heaven, The Phenomenon of the Ships in the Sky in Medieval Ireland and Beyond. Okay, so that is two main sources for this, two main sources for this show, this episode, but also there's other ones. Okay. These are two really good ones. So what these two guys came to uh, say separately in their writings, the, they talk about the Book of Ballymont, and this is num- reference number three. Book of Ballymont is a, a book compiled towards the end of the 14th century at the castle of Ballymont for Tonaltog McDonald, McDonald, who was there then in occupation of the castle. This is, might have been what I was thinking about before. Okay. So the Book of Ballymont. Um, what it said is um, there were ships in the air at Telltown. And this was translated from the Irish Marabella in the late 14th century, which became the Book of Ballymont. So uh, this is exactly what it says. I'm going to read what's written in this book of Ballymont. Got to do it in Irish accent. Oh, my God. No, thank you. That won't offend anybody. Congalach, son of Male Myth, in AD 956, or CE, was at the fair of Taltown on a certain day when he saw a ship sailing along in the air. One of the crew cast a dart at a salmon. The dart fell down in the presence of the gathering, and a man came out of the ship after it. When he seized its end from above, a man from below seized it from below. Upon which the man from above said, I am being drowned. <laughs> and he and uh, said he, let him go, said Kalnock, and he is allowed to go. And then he goes from there, from them swimming. <laughs> so that's written in the book of Balimont. So I guess Kalnock was mentioned uh, was some type of leader. I think he was a king or something. But and, the guy that came from their ship. No, this this Kalanok was there at the fair when he saw okay. this. But who, who's the one that's saying that they were drowning? The guy from the ship. Okay. okay. Yep. That's, but it, again, has to do with a something coming down to the ship. Yeah. Someone cutting it. Yep. Is that a man? Right. They didn't say some weird away. looking thing right the man sounds like the Merkel incident in some yeah, cases yeah yeah, yeah yeah so reference number four comes from Kuno Meyer the Irish Marabella and the Norse Speculum Regula 1910 Meyer further identifies a reference in the manuscript book of Lannister which I mentioned before in which the appearance of three ships in the air is mentioned as one of the wonders of Telltown hmm. When King Domnell Mac Merchada, seventeen sixty or seven sixty three, was in the fair. So this was another king at the fair, seven sixty three this time. Okay. This is what's written 
uh, Kuno Meyer, you know, found this in this Norse speculum regula, the Irish Marabella. I'm sure it's Marabella or something. Sorry. Sarah Island and the Norse people. This is what it says in the book. The king of the Irish was in an the open air exercise ground for martial games at a certain time when uh, with diverse crowds with soldiers amerable in their arrangements. Lo, suddenly they see a ship racing through the air from which at the moment a man had thrown a spear after a fish which rushed to the earth but the man swimming after it drew it back. Who is going to hear these things? That's what's written. Is it kind of the same account almost? Kind of. Guy from a ship thrown. That's 763. That's that's dated 763. The previous one talks again at the fair was 956. The. It says two different accounts, same kind of story. Yeah. Even sound kind of story as Merkel. Um, we're gonna jump to number five, and this one was uh, by a person named Gilia Patrick uh, Petraic, also known as Patricus was the second bishop of Dublin. He died in October of, 10, uh, of 1084. So Patrick gives a Latin verse account of the story, which closely parallels that in the book of Balamont, though leaving out the intervention of the Cognac and the man on the ground. What's Cognac? I can't remember what that was. Look that up. C-O-N-G-A-L-A-C-H. Because I'm interested... I think he was important. So anyway, this uh, was the first, the second Bishop of Dublin. He gives a Latin verse account of the story. How's it spelled? C-O-N-G-A-L-A-C-H. Conalock? Is that Conalock? That sounds, yeah, Conalock. Oh, sounds right. I'm, I got it wrong. Of course, is it? <laughs> uh, according to Wikipedia, it was a high king of Ireland. According to the list of the annals of the four masters from around 944 to 956. Okay, so they're saying in multiple... References that are saying this guy that I guess I guess is a high king of England or of Ireland saw this event or was it present in this event around this time? Although this Patrick, uh, the second bishop of Dublin, kind of has the same story that he says or he gives reference to, but he uh, it parallels the, from the the story from the Book of Balimont, but uh, he doesn't say that Colonock was there. Okay. Okay. All right. In the sixth reference. The, there was a manuscript from 15th or 16th century with an unknown author. It was translated by Professor Kenneth Hurlston Jackson. Uh, in, he died in 1991. He was an English ling- linguist and translator who specialized in Celtic languages. So he translated this, um, un, this manuscript, which is on display in, um, in Ireland. Uh, you can go see the manuscript that he translated, although it has no author. They're not really sure where it came from. Mm-hmm. However... In this book that he translated, there this retelling moves the story from Telltown to the Church of Clamic Noise, and instead of a fishing spear, it is an anchor that is dropped. Clone McNoise? Is that Clone McNoise? Clone McNoise. That's the monastery. Right. What it says in in his translation, uh, the book that he translated, one day the monks of Clamic Noise were holding a meeting on the floor of the church, and as they were at their deliberations. There they saw a ship sailing over them in the air, going as it were on the sea. When the crew of the ship saw the meeting and the inhabited place below them, they dropped anchor, and the anchor came right down on the floor of the church. And the priest seized it. A man came down out of the ship after the anchor, and he was swimming as if uh, he were in water till he reached the anchor. And they were dragging him down. Then, for God's sake, let me go, he said. For you are drowning me. Then he left them swimming in the air as before, taking the anchor with him. This is the sixth reference of the same exact story. Sixth reference of the same exact story. This is weird because we did the other airship episode, like, you know... uh, Humankind was on the cusp of, uh, you know, flight, man flight. 
Correct. It's kind powered of powered flight. Powered flight. Thank you. So it's kind of understandable. Like maybe these are people early inventors testing powered man flight, but this is. It's more realistic to have these people in the 18, late 1800s testing. Yeah, yeah. You know, but what the hell's the going rituals, on here, man? Like, right. Like, in the 15th, this? 16th century, this is being this is a manuscript it's, that that was specifically from. Right. But also the records go back to 743. Right. And it's almost telling the exact same story. Right. Over hundreds of years. So this, I mean, is this just word of mouth or like, you know, like, um, what's it called when people like pass on stories? Tradition from, type tra- of thing. Yeah. Like, it's like a game of telephone. Yeah. Yeah, but also... Is it all just originally originating the, from one, the first story that was told, and then it kind of keeps passing it along? Or like, each, each of the annals of the four masters, there's four different books. Yeah. I think they're all written around the same time, and they were all saying kind of the same thing almost. Right. But giving a different retelling of it, I think. Again, there's so much written on this from very specific authors who really studied the crap out of it, which is awesome. Right. But like they go real deep. And we're going to go into a lot of these theories. That's yep. awesome because it's so, sometimes it's like makes total sense. Sometimes you're like, wait a second. What, what were these guys seeing? Right. So my seventh reference, the anchor form of the story spread outside Ireland and can be found in both chronicle of the late 12th century French abbot, Geoffrey du Brule, Brulel, where the anchor was supposedly dropped onto London in 1122. Mm. Uh, Louis Go. Gogong, Gugod, 1924, uh, wrote, did some research about this, wrote about the um, book called Tilbury's Otea Imperiala, Imperiala yeah. which was completed in 1211 CE. Uh, so in, in the book, Til, Tilbury's Otea Imperiala tells us that when leaving their local church somewhere in Britain, one dark and cloudy day, prisoners saw a ship dropping anchor, which was embedded in the heap of stones in the churchyard and a rope leading down from it. He continues, this is a direct quote, the people were amazed and while they discussed it among themselves, they saw the rope move as, as if the crew were struggling to free the anchor. When it would not budge, For all of their tugging, a voice was heard from the thick air, like the clamor of sailors vying to recover the thrown anchor. Nor was it long until hope and the effectiveness of exertion having been exhausted, the sailors sent down one of themselves, who, as we have heard, dangling from the anchor rope, came down hand over hand. When he was about to disengage the anchor, he was seized by bystanders. He grasped the hands of his captors like the man lost in a shipwreck and died suffocating in the moisture of, the, <laughs> of our thicker air. But the sailors overheard, surmising that their comrade had drowned, cut the anchor rope after ha- having waited for an hour and, the sail- and sailed away, leaving the anchor. That was from... So, sorry, that guy died? Like supposedly. The okay. In the story, right. which was written... In the Otia Imperiala in twelve eleven. And then now there's another version where he, he drowned as well, right? Like I think so. earlier one. Okay. Um he was going to drown. Okay. And he said, okay. Let go of me and he swam away. So that was okay, so that was written late twelfth century French abbot Geoffrey de Brule, which was then researched by Louis Gogard in nineteen twenty four. And that was from the Otia Imperiala. Okay, so this is this is number eight. The last medieval retelling of this story of the airships of Columbic Noise was found in an old Norse book called Konogs Skogjodza. <laughs> you did great. You did great. Just being confident yeah. is a big part of that. So you got that right. With that, what, actually, what that means is Old Norse uh, for King's Mirror, or in Latin, Speculum Regula. For King's Mirror? That's what the Norse is for that. That word I just said. Konogs no skrugugja. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll put the word on the screen. So mirror. What the hell I'm talking about. It's in It's in the resources. Just go down and look for some Norse. <laughs> so it's a mid-century, uh, mid-13th century work, which they dated to around 1250. It was originally intended for the education of King Magnus Lagbote, the son of King Hakon. Econison, 
and has the forms of dialogue between a father and son. So the book, this book was the one I was talking about with between yep. father and son talking to each other. So 1250 CE. Here's what it says. There is yet another thing that will, be, uh, will seem most wonderful, which has happened in the city called Clomacnoise. In that city is a church, which is sacred to the memory of the holy man who is called Karanus. And there is thus befell on a Sunday, when people were at the church and were hearing mass, there came dropping from the air above an anchor, as if it were cast from a ship, for there was a rope attached to it, and the fluke of the anchor got hooked. And in an arch at the church door, all of the people went out of the church and wondered what wondered and looked upwards at the rope. They saw a ship floating on the rope and the men in it. And next they saw a man leap overboard from the ship and dive down towards the anchor, wanting to loosen it. His exertion seemed to them by the movement of his hands and feet like that of a man swimming this guy in the sea. Learn, learn his lesson. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's the same story. Just, or is it multiple shit? Well, and when he dying. came down to the anchor, he endeavored to loosen it. And then some men ran over towards him and wanted to seize him. But in the church to which the anchor was fastened, there is a bishop's chair. The bishop was by chance on the spot and forbade the men to hold that man. For he said that he would die as if he were held in water. He's being baptized. And as soon as he was free, he hastened his way up again to the ship. And as soon as he came up, they cut the rope and they sailed on their way out. Out of the sight of men. And the anchor has ever since lain at witness of the event at the church. Hmm. What are you thinking now? Because that's my last reference. I'm about to go into some theories here. So there's a bishop. Is that a church? It just said, don't save the man, don't help that man? No, they said, in this last reference, yep. they said, don't touch him, let him go. Yep. Yep. So. I don't know anything is like a baptism kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's almost the exact same story, like, and this is, a hundred, this is all hundreds, hundreds of years apart, right? Mm-hmm. 743 was the first recorded. Yep. And sorry, this last one was what? 1211. No, wait, I'm um, sorry, 1250. Okay. And that was an Old Norse record. Mm. There was a 1211 record. There was um, 12th century. Uh, there's one in England. There's one 15th and 16th century manuscripts. Yep. There's one in 1084. No, no, sorry, that's when the guy died. Uh, that was a, there was no date on that one. All right, so here, let's look, look, look what, are the, what are the commonalities? There's, there's, <clears throat> there's an airship, airships. There's an anchor yep. guy trying to release the anchor, right? He's trying to like climb down it. Yes, he tries to get it unstuck. Yeah, and then some instances he dies, or gets washed away, or so has to has he's to drowned. Yeah. yeah, or he runs away. Right. Back to the ship. Okay. And every common thing, it's a ship in the air yeah. dropping anchor. Right. The ship is in the air. There's multiple people. There's more people on it. Yeah. And it floats away. Sometimes it leaves the anchor behind. Like, I wonder if we can go to Merkle, Texas and see this anchor. Yeah. So we sorry, there are instances where he does get back on the ship? Every, I think there's only a few when he actually dies. I think there's like one or two. Uh, okay. The rest okay. of them, he all makes it back. There's some kind of big, I mean, there's got to be some kind of biblical thing. Uh, like a biblical, like, uh, allegory or like uh, story going on here. It seems like all the stories are generally the same, but what do you learn from that? It's not like they're saying it outright. Yeah, that's true. Do you want me to go into the theories, or you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah. sure? Yeah, sure. You really ready for this? <laughs> well, I the fact put that on you, your swimmies. The fact that you said like, um, what would you call this? Like something from heaven? 
like in like the very beginning, you're like, we're gonna call this airships. Oh yeah, it's called like airships. And like, mm-hmm. there's a, one of the one of the uh, books that you reference that S- mentions heaven. It says uh, how to sail to heaven, the airships yeah. of Klamath yeah. Village. So it's, there's got to be some kind of religious significance, something kind like of, that. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through these theories. All right. Like I did before in past episodes, I put them least likely, most unlikely to most likely. Okay. Okay, and they range from just a cloud formation, the aurora borealis, evidence of alien visitation. Right. There's kind of a range here, right? So we're gonna go number one, Excited. most unlikely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, you ready for this? All right, you got your anchor with you? Yep. Okay. I'm anchored in. The alien visitation hypothesis. Some speculate. You're the, saying this is more likely than no, so cumulus is, I'm clouds? Going, I'm going mis, most unlikely to yeah. less likely. But you're saying cumulus clouds is more likely than this? Aliens? This is the most unlikely. Yeah. But you said you said that you mentioned previously that cumulus clouds might be a reason. I'm saying that's just an overview. Okay. So I'm starting with the most unlikely. Yeah. If you mentioned clouds being a thing over aliens. Because there's per- people coming from this. How do you know clouds aren't aliens? <laughs> Have you been up there? I've been in a plane. Heaven, heaven's been been up, in, heaven's supposed to be in the clouds. Yeah. How do you know those clouds aren't? Have you seen Independence Day? Those clouds yeah. turned into spaceships. Their clouds are masking the spaceships. Are you saying <laughs> that Will Smith, our protector, <laughs> was Welcome wrong? Earth, Chris. All right, sorry. Number one, most unlikely... Alien visitation. Some speculate this could be ancient airships. These ancient airships could be the earliest UFO sure. sightings. I mean, we got yeah, we got on record. We got to put the alien thing out there. Because remember, you, with alien visitation, you take gotta consider the time period of what the people could think that is. Right. A airplane is a ship in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. They they never seen an actual airplane, so like they or a use flying their own, saucer. Yeah, they have to use their own knowledge of the the world that is theirs to understand try and grasp what they're seeing so their explanation you know would be related to that yeah number two most unlikely uh, most unlikely second most unlikely for aliens are first yeah. although you always think that's weird over is ghosts it... <laughs> last time you, was the most <laughs> less thing you said aliens were more unlikely than ghosts yeah come on all right Go no, I'm just saying. <laughs> These could have been lost technologies or anomalies for time tra- travel. Mm. Some would suggest so you could suggest that these ships might be time traveling vessels or glimpses of alternate realities traveling to our reality. Okay. They could be from ancient civilizations. Now, now this is starting to sound like uh who uh, possessed lost technologies All right. that gave them ability to fly to us? Ancient civilization. Could be. Or time travelers. What's more likely? Aliens? Time travelers or ancient <laughs> civilizations? Ancient civilizations have that technology, I feel like. No, no. I don't know. This, this, this one... Uh, well, I guess even the alien one too reminds me that we've talked about this guy before on the History Channel. Uh, the guy with the hair, Giorgio Stephanopoulos or something. Stephanopoulos or yeah, eh, no, I don't like that one, Chris. So you don't think it's time travelers you. from an or, or or travelers from a distant alternate reality? Well, no. What do you think is more likely? Aliens? <laughs> no, no, no. Like in general, do you think? So wait, you're saying this could either be an ancient technology. That's like like that's Atlantis re- had this there flying right, around. That, that's been rediscovered. What's more likely, that or time travel? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Huzzah. <laughs> Is time travel more likely than aliens? Because in that case, I would have those flipped. <laughs> you may say that. What if aliens can time travel? <laughs> I would think they have to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could say like ancient civilizations could have been aliens, you know, they, and then they were flying around. On what? 
they're ancient civilizations. <laughs> they came here. Like you're saying, theory ancient, that like, ancient civilizations and the people already lived on Earth. No, I'm saying like ancient civilizations could have been aliens coming down here and hanging. Oh, out. All right, right. yeah. Okay. So they would have had the technology yeah. to fly around. Yeah. What's more likely, time travel or aliens? I'm say aliens. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> but alternate realities is what I'm thinking at. Okay. You may want to flip those for your sake. <laughs> this, yeah. But Big Daddy likes them where there are. Okay. Do you think alternate realities? I you know I think is real. Yeah, I think okay. yeah. I think there's to be so many different universes out there. There has to be some kind of like you know. Well, do you think it's all? Do you think it's actually like just other universes that are like just parallel, in, like, parallel, like floating in the. Gal, like we have our universe inside so, of so other universes. We say we say ultra reality. You're saying like uh, there's like a me version of me over there, but like a that has tweak. a lot of hair on the head, but not <laughs> yeah. on the face. <laughs> like a tweak. Yeah, 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 like something. I don't know about that. I think there's other universes. Sure. I don't know if there's other me's. Probably is. I'm definitely it's dominant infinite. traits. Right. It's infinite, right? There's got a. I don't know. I don't know. Look at that theory that we're just atoms. You know, like our galaxy, our universe is an atom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like the men in black theory. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here's my brain. So we have, okay, aliens, time travel, <laughs> ancient civilizations that are traveling around in airships. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Then we go to the Merkel incident okay. in reference to it being, which we talked about at the beginning of the show, possibly early flying machines. But that was. There's enough similarities. The 700s though, right? There's a whole report contains enough. This report, all these reports, contain enough similarities to the various versions of the Klamath noise story, demonstrate a link between the incidents of the 1800s and the late 1800s to the incidents of the Klamath noise airships. Too early. I don't know. Like what? Uh. Yeah. Even though. I mean, maybe it took them that long to fly from London. From they they went to Ireland to London to Texas. <laughs> okay, let's go what, a little. Yeah, what, what would they have used if it wasn't like an ancient technology or alien like thing? Which again, I know well, it's, it's, it's took them so long because the, the wind fetched. But like, are they, what are they using? Like balloons? Or balloon? The balloons aren't even around back then, were they? No, no, no. I don't know. Pig. I mean, hot air was around. Yeah, blown up like. Pig bladders, maybe? I don't know. They're an ancient civilization. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. Do whatever they want. <laughs> but as it relates to like human ingenuity and human flying That's, that's what machines, I'm saying. It just seems like... That seems a little far-fetched. Yeah, maybe sure. that should be above aliens. Maybe aliens are more likely. I should have like a, like a bingo card so we can like rearrange stuff <laughs> as we go like on the board. <laughs> okay. Um, what we're going to next one is a... What we'll call psychological uh, and cultural factors... In society, so one thing could be what's called pareidolia, which is our tendency to perceive familiar shapes like ships in random patterns when combined with as- atmospheric effects, which could perceive or could look could people lead people to think they're seeing a ship, but okay. multiple people right. would have to be seeing at the same time. Yes, multiple people, same instance, like a mass and, hysteria kind of thing. In in. Re- Recorded hundreds of years apart. Yep. They could also combine that with a cultural context, which ancient cultures often associate celestial events with divine or supernatural significances. Ships in the sky might symbolize out- otherworldly messages or something like that as it relates to their form of society, like their view of society. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So this could be nothing more than a mass hysteria type of thing. Like you said... Everybody seeing some kind of strange thing in the sky because we're all the same angle, same time of day, that type of stuff. But how would you explain the people? And yeah, the right. Yeah, anchor? the man with the anchor. Yeah, yeah, right. It's almost like they were underwater at that point, maybe. Yeah. Like yeah. the guy swimming through the air. Yeah. Hmm. That church wine got him real <laughs> messed up. <laughs> man, I mean, you know, this. Might have been during the potato famine too, so these people might not have been eating. <laughs> what was know, that? You know, it might be uh, a little loopy from not eating much. All right, next theory is uh, me- meteorological events, such as lenticular clouds, uh, which are lens-shaped clouds often formed near mountains, 
Their elongate appearance could resemble ships. Rolling clouds, which are long cylindrical clouds that roll across the sky, may invoke ship imagery. And iridescent clouds, which are colorful cloud patterns caused by dif- a diffraction of sunlight, can cause a ship-like form. So those are, again, yeah. you think these uh, people from Atlantis are more likely than these, <laughs> than these clouds? I don't know. It does seem strange that clouds, yeah. which back then people have nothing else to do, so they're probably looking at clouds all the time. Especially yeah, in the that area. That looks like a rabbit. That looks like an yeah. airship. The There's same... a guy coming down from on a rope. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Meteorological event sounds like it could be the most likely, but really, I'm just saying like oh, so it seems up until like, now, like it's, it's like oh through. okay yeah I mean most likely like okay yeah it makes sense like so but like what would have what like okay what like, was what was the guy coming down yeah was yeah, he come was, really coming down out of a castle but they they couldn't see the castle because it was all a foggy. cloud all right let's go to the next theory then since you shot down the meteorological <laughs> crap a bunch of Weather nerds. <laughs> it's, the way the moon was uh, reflecting light off of the, of the, of the cloud. It's called Sundog. <laughs> <laughs> so, another theory could be optical illusions and with uh, atmospheric effects. So, something like a mirage that occur during, uh, due to a variation in air density, temperature, and light refraction. This could make distant objects, including ships, appear elevated or suspended in the sky. Some, something which a recent research has brought up into this, into this uh, phenomenon, which is called an ocean mirage, um, which can make ships at sea appear above the horizon. And I've seen yeah, this before. Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah. That's kind of cool. All right, all right. There's also something called a... Fata Morgana, which is a complex mirage caused by temperature inversions. Fata Morgana can create intricate, distorted images of ships or buildings on the horizon. So a ship is really far away. Yeah, sure. Um, And then the other one is a sun dog. (laughs) It's an atmospheric phenomenon, like um, uh, an atmospheric phenomenon where bright spots near the sun and halo rings around the sun or moon can create a ship-like shapes in the sky. That's kind of a little. Good. I've seen those before. We've talked about them before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sun dogs in in previous like the alien the airships which were sure. brought up in past like ancient history. So I didn't even bring up those ones I talked about at the beginning of that episode. Oh right, 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 yeah, yeah, like yeah. The battle in Way the sky. Back. Yeah, 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 yeah. But those were around the same time. Sure. But, but again, like one, what's this? Who's this guy? Who's who's the rope? Yeah. Or what's the rope deal? Like Who's the, the rope? Who's the rope? <laughs> Who's the rope guy? Sounds like a terrible game. All right. Here's my last theory. This is kind of a bigger one, okay? Also could be cons- next to this, the ocean mirage, which a lot of historians and researchers say that probably the most likely. This is the historical context theory that this could be nothing more than an issue of historical context on the part of modern people who do not understand the mindset of those who were alive in the time All the right. references were written. Sure. Medieval mindsets of people in early Christian and medieval Ireland believed in miraculous occurrences. The appearances of airships was just one of many wonders recorded in annals. Symbolism, such as ships that symbolize journeys, transitions, or spiritual quests, these ships uh, voyage through the heavens resonate with uh, religious narratives so these kind of stories um, one example of this theory uh, is the Bantry Karak carving okay so this is something at Klamak Noise okay, yep. it's, uh, the Bantry Karak carving a Karak is a boat so there was a researcher Francisca Henry Francisca Henry 60 years ago, about, uh, she recognized that this boat depiction on the Bantry or Kilnarowin stone pillar, that's uh, the Bantry correct carving, it's on a pillar called the Kilnarowin stone pillar. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a long word with a K. <laughs> she attributed the carving to the 8th century. Francisca noted that the boat shoots straight upward amidst a sea of crosses. Okay. Mm. The boat crosses, uh, the cross over the rudder leaves little doubt that represents a boat of the, of the church sailing to heaven. Uh, Paul Johnstone um, in 1964, 
He identified the boat as a Karak. And there was researchers recently, uh, other researchers have recently confirmed that it is a representation of the ship of the church. Okay. Okay. So the carving itself is a relief carving and stone pillar stands uh, at this, at Klamath Noise. It is 88 centimeters and uh, it's a sandstone pillar. It's clearly modeled on reality, capturing the essence of seafaring life. So, which you know, here's the four key features. Of that. Yeah, of the depiction: four men rowing. Uh, the it shows four men pulling hard on their oars, symbolizing which, again, researchers have said this could symbolize labor of dedication of the crew. There was a figure steering. A uh, fifth figure st- sits in the stern. And steers Pastor, or maybe directs the helm, uh, directs the steering oar to uh, guide the Karak's course. At the stern, there was a small cross mounted, signifying the Christian faith and divine protection during their voyage. There are three larger crosses carved outside the boat: one beside the bow and two beside the stern. These crosses are. Com- uh, conventionally upright and at right angles to the cross within the Karak. Collectively, they affirm the overall meaning of the panel, the symbolism that goes along with this. They represent, um, representationally, representationally, they, uh, the Karak is being rowed, heaven's word, by its crew. Symbolically, the ship of the church voyages through the heavens towards salvation. Yep. So that is what's carved at this stone pillar in the clamic noise. Good. And that is also my final theory on the airships of clamic noise. So I, I like that last theory. It makes the most sense, but what would the be the symbolism, religious symbolism of that guy with the anchor? Right. And not only that, but is that, that is that someone who like lost their faith or but then he's trying to release anchor for them to get up to heaven in this scenario. Right, right? he's trying to save them. Yeah. He's, he's giving himself up for saving, save the, the crew. Yes, for the greater good. But this was carved, in, it's dated to be carved in the 8th century. Okay. The stories go back to 743. Right. The original, like the first tellings of it. And there's also, uh, you know, we said Which there's- would have been around that time. There's lots of time. Well, 8th century is- That's what I mean, like, yeah. it's all- there's lots of, oh, then yeah, it also yeah. continues. Yes, right, right, sorry. So there may have been other stories like this in the church within the, with, of the faith and, and people that carried this story with them. But it seems so specific to what was going on, re- being recorded. I read the recordings yeah. from these translations and things like that. You know, this reminds, like, this reminds, obviously, the airship one we did, but it reminds me a lot of um, uh, the uh, Pied Piper. Remember, like, a lot of that might have had, uh, that town kept, Sharing that story forward, forward yeah. for like a couple of centuries, right? Like it was on the church in the stained glass window. I think they kept record of it for hundreds of years. Yeah, yep. So it's kind of like that. That might have been a religious allegory or like a religious symbolism to the it. Children had left. And, yeah. yeah, but I mean that was like more. It all of a sudden happened one year, and then the reference. This doesn't really reference back to that. This doesn't do like that does. Where that was referencing no, back to no, that specific I'm just, event. I'm just saying like that the religious aspect of it if you want to look at it both both being this the case is there's similarities similarities there but um i think this is the most probable re- logical reasoning that it was a historical context issue yeah of us not realizing people were very religious yes yeah and believed these things to be true sure. it just seems like it's so well told and explained by yeah. multiple papers multiple you manuscripts think, yeah but you think there would have been like I guess tapestry wouldn't have been had started then, but like it wouldn't have survived. That's true too. Yeah, that's a long time ago. Hmm. Was the people of Ireland in seven hundreds Christian, or was they part? What that was uh, part of the? Were they part of the um, 
Druid or Daedric or what's that called? Celtic? Yeah. Yeah, they were was Celtic, that, was, yeah. Was that a different religion? The, they would be, yes. So the Celtic they religion. Like, I think, I think the, oh man, I might get, the Celts may have been part of the, the like that Germanic okay. overlap umbrella. Um, I could be totally wrong about that. Who would they have been Christian in the 700s? When did Christianity come to Ireland? I mean, it probably was around because that was a monastery, right? Yeah, oh, for sure, yeah. But <clears throat> wasn't that story about um? What was that? I feel like they would have. Uh, no. Yeah, I think they would have most not mostly, but there would Christianity would have been there for sure because there was always this border conflicts between the like the Celts or the Germanic tribes of like around England with um. Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire obviously be, eventually became Christian, so I feel like it would have been, at some point prior to that, would have been introduced to... What society. was that story about uh, the, uh, was it Ireland, where like, someone brought Christianity and got rid of all the frogs or something? Snakes. Snakes. St. Patrick. That St. Patrick? Yeah. And that was this? Th- this says, early, uh, early Christian Ireland is period from about 480 to 1000 AD. Hmm. So it was running out of yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it coming in. Could have been related to that. Interesting. They believed prior to this. Yeah. Uh, they believed pagan. pagan yeah. yeah. Was that Celtic? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I believe they're part of like the Germanic Rello, what people considered were barbarians back then during the. Um, Those were just people who weren't Christian or something. Yeah. Like that? Basically. Okay. Yeah. Or even well, even like even the Roman Empire before oh, yeah. it was Christianity, people were just like, oh, everyone outside of us is barbarians. Like same thing we talked about Alexander the Great. Like a lot of the Greeks thought. People of the East were barbarians and vice versa, so. So it was incorrectly, it's often misstated that St. Patrick brought the faith to Ireland. It was already present before he was there. All right. So when, we, when was St. Patrick? St. Patrick. He, he, I think he's supposed to be the snake guy, right? <laughs> he's that snake guy. <laughs> he's the snake guy. That's, um, all, that's all he is, the snake guy. He's the patron saint of Ireland. Yeah. He was. That's all he's known for is being. Was he the first bishop of Ireland? Mm-hmm. Was he alive? So it doesn't say. Fifth, fifth century Romano British Christian missionary. So the 400s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right around the same time. Okay. Celtic Church. So. Yeah, I think that, that would have been early enough that there would have been like a kind of a uh, assimilation or like a com- combination of the two. Religions, maybe, before we started getting pretty. Uh, oh no, maybe not. You were going somewhere, and they just just jerked the wheel and got <laughs> traffic here. Well, I'm I'm trying to think because it's early enough in Christianity where maybe in Ireland, Christianity would have been there, but it still would have been a very Celtic, like Celtic Christian. Okay, there would have been yeah. a very big Celtic presence, so there might have been a, like a mishmash of the two religions. Yeah. Before, like, they started getting into, like, the um, heretical Christian branches, which came along, I think, even before this. So I don't, I don't know. That's what I was, I'm not sure was, what the timing of that would have been. But so, yeah, there's these like, different councils, like, the early, in early Christianity, that's deciding what actually is official canon as far as, like, the Holy Trinity and stuff like that. So I don't know if that would have been reached this part of the world or in Ireland then. So as far as like allowing the Catholic church or allowing a Celtic and like Christian fusion kind of thing. Okay. But so it would they were been, kind uh, of doing it just to like uh, get them on board. Maybe. For a couple. Or it would have been early enough that like there would be Celtic influences that I feel like might have been part of that symbolism. Okay. Christian symbolism that revolved around Christianity, but there'd be Celtic influences, certainly Irish influences, since they're like they're a seafaring kind of nation that dealt with a, a ship. Okay, I don't know. So it seems like this this theory or this story. It seems there's so many things happening across many hundreds of years. That's what's we yeah, like hundreds of years. Yeah, and it's they're all basically the same, the same story. story. Yeah. Being told traditionally, so is it just like something that the 
the uh, preacher said at church one day, and it's like the story he stuck with, yeah. and then he's kind of passed on for generations. And they thought it was real, you know, like event. You mean they eventually thought it was real? Like as this story got told in church, right? It was told over over generations. Yeah. Did they write it down, write it down, write it down, and they just thought it was something that actually happened? Maybe, yeah. Especially once you know Christianity or Catholicism, Catholicism became more prominent. I can Re- see that being the case. And it relates back to today where like science would say that's not possible, but right. back then they had no reference to that. No. And so that the idea of a historical context of us being d- disconnected from that. But I think it has to be like a, a, a part of their, I- maybe, I don't know, just that was part of that town's identity or that like area's identity. Like this is a crazy miraculous event, whether religious or not happened here, like it keeps getting passed down. Like a, maybe a point of pride. Why did the Norse take it on then? I don't, I don't know anything about that. Or, or, or the, the English. Yeah, why know, did it go or, happen or, in London? Or in Texas. <laughs> yeah, that's nothing. How did I didn't it, think about that. How did it get to Texas? Wait, wait, sorry, what year was that that, was, that happened in Texas? That was, um, the, it was around, the, it was during the 1897. That was specifically April 28th of 1897. Uh, it was printed in the Houston Post. I'm trying to think when the potato famine happened because a lot of people... I think it might have been right around there. A lot so of they left, left there yeah. and went to, and it was just kind of story. That's where people came. A lot of the Irish came to the United States. Maybe that one guy was like, "I got the anchor, man. I'm bringing it to the United States." He brought just an entire anchor, <laughs> anchor with him. We're like, dude, you should take how some you up, food. Yeah, man. how you end up in Texas? I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know, but like maybe it was like the people he came with might have. Uh... 1845 to 1852. There you go. All right. These guys went to Texas and <laughs> maybe, brought the story maybe. with them. Yeah, I mean, maybe like a big group of uh, like that, a clan went and like, this is kind of our identity. This is this will bring I- a piece of Ireland with us. Maybe I, I don't know. They were trying to put their own like. I wonder if there's like any little, like carvings, piece of, little piece of home with them. Yeah, I wonder if there's any like carvings down, like like someone carved this in the wall of churches down, or like maybe it's part of oh, their maybe. church down yeah, there. You know, yeah. I want to see this I want, story. I'd like to see that. Go see that. That'd be cool. I wonder if there's like a picture, picture or something like that oh, out I'm there. I'm sure there is. I'm sure it's like the only thing. And Merkle, Texas. What the hell's going on in Merkle, Texas? <laughs> I never heard of Merkle, Texas. It's somewhere. probably just like a bunch of refineries and yeah. then an anchor. It was, yeah, it was, that is how like someone from Ireland got that and came. Oh. The United States. I feel like it wouldn't be in Texas. Yeah. Well, they said they fa- they got it from that event in Texas, so they probably just ripped an, uh, okay. an anchor off okay. of someone, and yeah, yeah. they didn't bring it with them. Oh. Supposedly, they oh, said okay. it happened okay. there. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I was going off of that. They brought it with them. Yeah. Oh man, Merkle, Texas, is in the middle of Texas. Oh wow, yeah, central. Yeah. Jeez. Not that many people there. Lot. Well, okay. There's not that many people. There. Whoa. I don't know. Do you th- like? What do you think, man? I, I don't think it's like a sun dog or. At first, when I started looking at the story, so I stumbled across this story looking for, looking for another story about an ancient battle and aliens come and help them, mm-hmm. supposedly. And then I stumbled upon this somehow. You, yeah, you briefly brought it up in the other airship thing, right? But ancient battle with like the. Yeah, I kind of mentioned it, and yeah. I was going to go back and do that. Um, and then I was like, oh, this is. Uh, way more interesting and there's a lot of research about it generally really good research about it so when I re- start reading through all that stuff it kind of I really thought going into this that it was going to be like this is just clouds because even in the research in the books that are um, in the actually I put the actual book the Google book links uh, it's like a, there's a chapter here there they actually have images um, of sun of uh Sun dogs. Sun dog. No, of um, different images, different angles of um, clouds. Yeah. In different areas and locations, different temperatures. So this researcher, uh, this is a book by. It's called the Elemental Echo Criticism: Thinking with Earth, Air, Water, and Fire. And this book. Um, by this specific chapter, chapter four is Jeffrey Jerome Cohen. 
talks about this event and talks about clouds and how they could have been, you know, kind of saying clouds, ocean mirage, like kind of comparing all that, 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 those theories I talked about. Sure. And it's kind of interesting. That's why I thought going into this, I was like, it's just going to be clouds. Yeah. Clouds and different, you know, over the ocean. But also, I don't think clamic noise is near the ocean. It's up by a river. I think it's very close to the ocean because it's in the middle of the country. Okay. I, get, I mean, I see them, I don't know, mistaking clouds, and but like, again, there's a guy, they see guys in, in, in this, you know, device and a man coming down and there's an anchor, like, I don't think the cloud thing explains that. No. So, the clamic noise, like we said, was on the center of a river and we zoom out, it's nowhere near the ocean. Oh it's goodness. right in the middle of the country. Yeah. It's near Dublin. Clamic noise castle. Big, there's always like a big lake around there, though, isn't there? No, it's a bog. Yeah, it's it's uh, supposedly it's over. It looks over okay. a boggy area. So, I think. Yeah, so wait, I brought up. It, okay. I thought it was clouds. I think it's probably it. Most obviously, I'm not going to spread fake news here. I think it's probably <laughs> just a historical context thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I do like that. That uh, I forget who you said it was. That like we don't understand. Modern people might understand uh, medieval people's way of thinking, right? Which I think is definitely true. Like they probably could understand. Medieval people could probably understand people, mindsets of people from like you know the Roman period or something like that. But the idea of how they write or even like symbol like symbolism, like we. We would see that as taken as like, oh, they're being extremely factual. Like we're being literal about it, yeah. and they're being symbolistic right. or symbolic. Yeah, 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 exactly. Thank you. I think I think it's most likely, you know, some kind of symbolism. Why was it repeated? Do you think it was a story that was just repeated in church and they wrote it down? Probably, yeah, yeah. They do mention that ships symbolize journeys, transitions, and spiritual quests, oh. and that's probably what the preacher, you know, the monks were trying to I'm say. I'm sure that was even a thing, like in, in Germanic, these some of these Germanic or Celtic tribes too, like that. There's some spirituality with ships. That's what they knew. That they're, you know, they're probably depending on ships and like fishing and seafaring and stuff like that. So it's very much part of the culture. I would imagine a Kurok is just like a rowboat. Oh, all right. So. It's an Irish boat with a wooden frame. So it's just like a rowboat. Wooden rowboat. So it's kind of small. Can fit a couple guys. You know. So it's not like it's some crazy ship. It's just a simple man ship. You know. Like the Get- ship of a of a carpenter. <laughs> he had his cup. And his ship. You know. His rowboat. His, his Korok seeds. Yeah. All right. Are you ready to get the hell out of here? Close this one up. Put a Put a... <laughs> Put a nail in this. this I feel pretty curl. satisfied with that. What we, what we came to them. Not that we came to that. Like these are theories thrown out there, but I feel the, satisfied. The with arguments it. for and against what this could be. Yeah, it seems pretty cut and dry. But it's not definite. Yeah. Right, it could have been a mirage, yeah. an ocean mirage, or a mirage. Could I don't know. People from Atlantis with their flying ships. Yeah. What's more likely? Like I said, I still haven't answered my question. Time travel or aliens? <laughs> Going aliens is more likely. Man. I disagree. No, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's time traveling aliens. And we'll be like, oh, come on. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody out there for listening. Thank you. And coming along with us on this journey to the heavens. May all of your journeys be long and prosper <laughs> or prosperous. Please give us a follow if you like what you heard. Uh, give us a subscribe if you want to help us out. Those Both those things help us out immensely. Please follow us on social media. If you want to find our social media, go to mysteriouspals.com. Please send us an email if you've got ideas for an episode or want to chat or anything like that. Leave us comments, whatever you do to contact us or get a hold of us or want to chat with us. Just comment on videos. Bad criticisms are good too. Yeah. Criticism is criticism. It, it helps us out. I heard we talk too much, like I said. (laughs) We get off tangents. Yes. But thank you all for tuning in, tuning out. Send us to your friends. Send us to your enemies. Don't let go of that rope. Don't let go. Keep the anchor close. (laughs) 
And if you do, go mysteriously into the sky towards the heaven. Yeah. Z, heavens. Heavens. In those mysterious alien clouds. <laughs> those sundog aliens. Jordan, thank you All for right. being here. Thanks, Chris. Everybody out there, again, stay mysterious. We love you, and we will see you next time. Same mysterious time, same mysterious place with this mysterious face. I like that. I don't know. <laughs> Not really mysterious for another <laughs> yeah. All right, good night, everybody. Bye.